Exodus 26.33 It says, And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tax that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south and thou shalt put the table on the north side now I'm going to read a couple more places here before I get started much Leviticus 21-23 says uh, only he shall not go in under the veil nor come nigh unto the altar because he hath a blemish that he profane not my sanctuaries for I the Lord do sanctify them and then uh, one more scripture here I'm going to read real quick. Isaiah 59, one. he says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither His ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you, that He will not hear. If you will, bow your heads with me. A word of prayer. Father, we thank You, Lord, once again for this day, Lord, for all Your many blessings, Lord. We thank You for all these that's come this way tonight, Lord. And Lord, we just ask now, Lord, that You'd bless each one, Lord. Help us tonight. Give us understanding, Lord. Lord, allow us to move up, Lord. Allow us to repent, Lord. Show us the wrong that we've done, Lord, and help us to correct it, Lord. Lord Jesus, if there's a need here tonight, Lord, we ask, Lord, that You'd meet it, Lord. Whether it be for salvation or rededication, Lord, for healing, Lord, for whatever it may be, Lord, we know, Lord, that You can move in all these things, Lord. We ask now, Lord, that You would. Lord, I ask You now to help me, Lord. Give me the words to say here tonight, Lord. Help me to preach according to Your will, Lord. And help each one of us, Lord, to apply it, Lord, in our lives in a way that You'd see fit, Lord. Lord, just go with us now, Lord. Give each one of us a spirit of obedience here tonight, Lord. No spirit of fear in this place, Lord. Lord, it's all these things that we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. And Amen. Now, I guess... uh, I guess no doubt you've picked up on this veil a little bit. Uh, all these scriptures talks about a veil, and, and I've had a veil, the veil on my mind a lot uh, since Monday night. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, the, uh, they gave the invitation, the altar call, and uh, I was up there praying on the altar, and, and I, I've said in my prayer, Lord, take this veil from our eyes. I said that in my prayer, and, and you know, I, I tell everybody I don't get too much from God. I don't get, you know, God just don't speak to me a lot. But uh, it was God spoke to me that night, and He said, just as clear as I could say it to you tonight, uh, some people don't want the veil taken from their eyes. Some, some, some of us want the veil, and and maybe we can talk some about that. <coughs> but I want to tell you a little bit about this veil in the temple. Now we know, of course, that the veil was rent in twain much later on as Christ was crucified. Uh, And I'll get on that a little bit later here. Uh, But I want to tell you a little bit about this veil. I've been doing a little bit of researching today and and studying about this veil. some of this you can't get straight out of the Bible, the measurements and stuff. Uh, some of this you've got to go back through some history, Jewish and uh, Christian history, you know, runs together back in the Old Covenant. Uh, but this veil was 40 by 20 cubits, which is about 30 by 60 feet. This is a big veil. It's a very large outfit. Now, here's what really surprised me. The veil, 30 by 60 feet, was probably about 4 inches thick. It was as thick as the width of a man's hand. So probably about four inches thick. And it's estimated now that this veil weighed somewhere between four and six tons. This veil is not just a curtain, folks. It's not just a a piece of cloth hanging up there. Um, There was, again, this is according to history, but uh, there were designated 300 priests to move this veil around. It took 300 men to carry this veil, to move it around. You know, when the veil uh, was dirty, it took 300 men to move it around and clean the veil and all that kind of stuff. Uh, It was sewed together, pieced together, I guess you could say, uh, in 72 squares. There were 72 squares of this veil, sections of it, uh, that stayed together as far as I know. Maybe not when they moved it, but when it was up, there were 72 squares of it. So this veil uh, really is a much greater deal than what 
we've always thought maybe that it was. I always had in my mind that there's a curtain hanging there, you know, and that uh, you you know you could probably take it with, between your hands and just pull it apart. Uh, and according to what I was reading today, there uh, they I don't know why they did this, but uh, they actually tried to pull it apart with horses. They would hook horses to each side of it, and the horses couldn't pull the veil apart. I don't I, I didn't get to study deep enough into it to find out why they were doing that. Uh, but this veil is a big deal. I, I just want to leave you with that, uh, may, and that'll come into play a little bit later on here. But we see the the purpose of the veil was to divide uh, man from the Holy of Holies. There was a place in the temple of God there uh, where man was not to go except for once a year. i got some scriptures marked here uh, explaining the once a year deal. The, uh, Aaron was able to go in there once, one time a year and uh, offer sacrifice. And I'll talk a little more about that. But the veil was, uh, the purpose of the veil was to divide man from the most holy place of God here. Uh, man was not allowed to come into that place. Well, why wasn't he allowed to come in there? Uh, it was because, as it said there in Leviticus 21-23, it says, "...because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I the Lord do sanctify them." Uh, man was unholy. Man, and we still are, uh, we're still bound in an unholy flesh, a flesh that has to be brought uh, into subjection. I know we're supposed to present this body a living sacrifice. Uh, I believe that through prayer and supplication, through fasting, through all these things, uh, that we can bring this flesh into subjection. I really believe that God uh, has really and truly left us without an excuse for sin and, and uh, under our covenant. You know, I know that we're under grace and all this stuff, and I'm so happy about that tonight. I really am because I do fail. Uh, but really, in all honesty, I have no excuse for my failure. You see, uh, God changed me when He came in and saved me. Uh, I was born again, a brand new creature. Uh, there was a new man that uh, was resurrected. You know, as we talked about during the baptism. The other day, a uh, new man resurrected in place of an old man. Uh, and if I disobey God, it's because I've allowed myself to do that. It's because that I've submitted unto the flesh and submitted unto the old man. Uh, and we've talked a little bit here lately. You know, uh, Jeremy Ballard teaching that class over there. I was listening to it. Man, he done a good job uh, talking about how the, the devil probably don't even fight us. The devil don't come against us uh, until we've overcome ourselves. You see, uh, there's lots of people running around in the church house today and uh, boy, they can't hardly get through the door until they've told somebody how the devil is fit with them all day long. Uh, listen, I know he's an adversary, but I also know this. Uh, there's a lot of us that the devil don't even bother with because we bring it up on our own self. Uh, you know, like David said a while back there, he said, you know, uh, people come in, man, the devil's been fighting me. i got a flat tar on my car. Uh, he said, did you ever think maybe you just run over a roof and nail, you know? Uh, listen, the devil don't deserve glory for everything that happens to us and all that kind of stuff. I promise you one thing tonight. Uh, if you're a born again child of God, I'm talking about, I've got the goods now. I'm not talking about uh, run down an aisle popping bubble gum sometime or another. I'm talking about a brand new creature born of God. Uh, there ain't nothing gets to you unless God allows it. You see, uh, God don't just allow everything uh, without His knowledge. He don't look away and say, well, just let them fend for themselves. Uh, if some something has got to you tonight, it's because God allowed that uh, to get through that old hedge, to get past His hand of protection, folks. Listen, <clears throat> you know, you never know what reason God has in things. I was reading this little thing a while back, and this guy was really complaining to God because he'd let him oversleep and he'd let his car break down and all this kind of stuff. And uh, God was explaining to him at the end of the day there was a wreck on the interstate and you'd have been right in the middle of it, you know. And uh, all this kind of—I can't remember all, all that it had, you know, that it had in there. But I, I do know this: nothing happens to us outside God's control. You know, uh, God has a purpose in all these things that gets to us. You see, uh, but it's because of, of the blemish that we've got. Now, he said in Isaiah, he said that. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, uh, and your sins have hid His face from you uh, that He will not hear. Listen, uh, there's another place in Isaiah, I don't remember which chapter it's in, uh, where it talks about God being ashamed of His people. Listen, uh, there's another little piece of my prayer. Lord, make us a people that you are not ashamed of. Uh, I don't want God to look at me and say, I'm ashamed of that one. You see, uh, I want God to look at me, uh, and I want Him to say, look here, behold, this is my son right here. 
here uh, in whom I am pleased a little bit, maybe not well pleased as he was with Christ, you know. I know that I've got infirmity, I do fail and all that kind of stuff. I can't compare to the man. Uh, but I do want God to be pleased with me. I want Him to see me striving and working. Uh, listen, I don't want to bring reproach upon the name of God through willful sin. Uh, and I, I've talked a little bit about it before in the church today. Here we are, uh, born again, supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. Uh, and we make this great big deal about willful sin, unwillful sin, all this kind of stuff. Uh, listen, you, you want the truth of the matter tonight? Uh, if you was where you were supposed to be tonight, and if I was where I was supposed to be tonight, uh, if I was being led by the Spirit of God as I'm supposed to be, uh, then there is no sin except for willful sin tonight. There we have no excuse. If our steps are ordered by God... What are we to say when we fail? Are we to say, well, uh, God directed me wrong? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I've never messed up when I've been paying attention to God, folks. Not one time has God steered me wrong. Not one time has He led me in a wrong direction, caused me to fail. You see, uh, He don't tempt me. God don't do that to me. Uh, if I fail, it's because I've allowed myself to fail. Because of my iniquities. Because of my iniquities have I been separated from God. He says, I told you I'd say a little bit about the, the once a year thing. In, in Exodus 30.10, it says, uh, And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year uh, with the blood of the sin offering uh, of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it uh, through your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Now, now, I didn't hear the man say it, but I heard of a man saying a while back, been three or four years ago, uh, that he was the holy of holies. Now, I'm going to tell you what that man did. Uh, he told a big fat one right there. That's what he done. Uh, there, Christ is the Holy of Holies today, folks. That's that's our holy place. Uh, that's where we go. That is our, our place of sanctification. Uh, in Hebrews 9, 7, he says, But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. You see, this high priest, as he goes into this Holy of Holies, uh, he takes blood with him. Why? Well, uh, which he offered for himself. You see, he had to make atonement for his own sin before he could go into this holy place uh, and for the errors of the people. And it says the Holy Ghost, this signifying uh, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest uh, while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now what's he talking about? While that temple stood and while that veil hung there in place, uh, the, the way into this most holy, talking about Christ, that had not been made manifest. You see, it had not been made known. Uh, the people under that covenant, the people under the law, all this kind of stuff, uh, they had not seen the way to Christ until that temple was uh, uh, shaken that day, until the veil was rent from top to bottom, uh, until Christ was made manifest in our heart, folks. Now, I'm telling you, I, I don't believe that any man can stand before God without excuse. Now, I used to work with a man. He was my boss, and, and God gave me a little ounce of boldness one day there. Now, I just a little baby Christian didn't know uh, much and still don't know very much, but I started to talk to him. Uh, he said, I'm not an atheist. He said, I believe there's a God. Uh, he said, I'm probably what you call a deist. I said, well, what's that? Uh, he said, I believe there's probably some kind of God out there, but He don't care nothing about us. Uh, I said, oh, you're wrong about that, brother. I said, He loves me, you see. Uh, and I started to ask him there. I said, have you ever felt a drawing of God? Now, he had been married before and his first wife had went to church and he would went some with her. I said, did you ever sit in that church house and feel something drawing you to that altar, drawing you to pray, drawing you to accept God. Now, he said, no, I never felt that. Now, I said, well, then one thing I can promise you is that one day before you die, uh, you're going to feel that because God told us plain uh, that the grace of God that brings salvation appear, hath appeared unto all men. Now, listen, Christ is going to be made manifest to us somehow or another. Uh, Brian Gabber talked about it. He said some girl he knew uh, said she just couldn't get a hold of that. How do these people in other countries, foreign lands, all this, that's never heard about God. <coughs> 
How can Christ be made manifest to them? How can this grace of God appear unto them? And he said he told that girl, he said, listen, there's some things you just have to take on faith, sister. Uh, listen, I don't have to understand everything God's doing. I just have to understand uh, that He's going to do what He said He was going to do, folks. Uh, listen, I don't, like I preached here the other night, I don't have to explain God. Now, I don't have to justify Him, none of those things. Now, all i got to do is make Him manifest in my life. You see, uh, what are you presenting before this world out here today? Uh, what you are tonight. You know, I'll pull a David Ballard here on you. Uh, what you are tonight is what you believe Christ to be. You see? Uh, but what are you presenting to this world outside this church house tonight? You know? Uh, are you walking out there and doing the same old thing that they're doing? Uh, are you talking the same way that they're talking? Are you drinking the same thing they're drinking? Uh, listen, God's not pleased with that and that is not what Christ is. Uh, why, whether that's what you've made Him to be or not, that's not what He is. You see? You've made Christ a lie. Oh, how Christians today, and I've done it myself. I wish I could stand up here and boast and tell you I hadn't, but I've done it myself. I've brought shame upon the name of the Lord before with things I've done. And I've had to repent. Boy, I tell you, I'm like old Esau. I've sought it carefully with tears, you know. Uh, there's been times when I realized what I'd done and I really just come back to God broken and ashamed. i tell you what, but He said I'm near to the one uh, that's of a broken heart and of a contrite spirit, you know. I, I tried to explain that to my friend. He thought he couldn't be forgiven. I said, you ain't done nothing you can't be forgiven of. I said, God loves you just the same as He always did. Uh, and I said, let me ask you something. I said, how how much would you have to love somebody uh, to die for them? He said, I'd have to love them quite a bit. I said, if you loved them enough to die for them, then you'd love them enough to forgive them, wouldn't you? He said, I would. Listen, this veil is gone, folks. We got no excuse. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. You know <laughs> I don't know what kind of excuse you wrote in here on, but, <laughs> you know. It says that in Exodus 34-33, it says, "...until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face." Now, he'd been in the presence of God and his face shone so bright that he, they was afraid of him. The children of Israel was afraid of him. They told Aaron, to said, "...tell Moses, put something over that shining face. We don't like the looks of that, you see." It says, "...but when Moses..." Listen to this. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. While he spoke to an unholy people, he wore the veil. But while he spoke to a holy God, the veil had to be taken away, you see? That veil is put there to separate that which is unholy from that which is holy, folks. Listen, God's not going to accept the, the unholy thing. You know, I know, like I said, I, I understand the covenant we're under and all that kind of stuff. I understand uh, that we're not bringing bulls and goats and things like that for sacrifice. Uh, but I also understand that the, the life we live is a sacrifice before God. Uh, and just the same, listen, just like God didn't accept some three-legged goat back under the old covenant, uh, God don't accept some half a life lived for Him, folks. Uh, he don't uh, He don't accept a half heart or anything like that. Uh, God wants you to bring everything you got to Him. He wants you trusting in Him. Uh, he wants you allowing Him to work in your life. You know, uh, so many of us, God speaks to us. God makes us understand. God convicts us. God deals. God, uh, all these things. And if we can't hear Him speak, we could open His Word and see what it says. Uh, but so many things that we're convicted of, we justify in our own selves. Uh, we say so and so down the road's doing that. God, you let them do it. Uh, listen, my mom and dad, you know, they didn't let me do everything that the neighbor kids done. Uh, a lot of them done a lot of things, and I thought, boy, I ought to be able to do that too because uh, you know they're doing it out the road there or something like that. Uh, I remember one time a long time ago there we had a neighbor uh, about once every two or three months he'd get on a big drunk out there. You know, uh, one day I asked my 
my dad. I said, can I go out the road and play with these kids out there? He said, no, you can't go. That's all he said. He wasn't much one to explain himself. Uh, so I caught him gone and I went to my mom. You see, I went in there and I said, Mommy, can I go out there out the road and play with these kids? She said, yeah, I guess you can go. She didn't know it, but the man out the road had been drunk for about a week, you see. Uh, my dad, my father was trying to protect me from something uh, that he didn't want me around. Listen, uh, just because you can look down the road and find somebody else doing something ungodly uh, don't mean that your father is going to allow you to do it, folks. Now uh, listen, uh, the chances are if that person down the road is born again, uh, they're under conviction about it themselves. They know better. Uh, but somewhere down the road, they've got a hold of some kind of man-made doctrine uh, and they said, this is all right to do. Uh, but God is not going to accept that unholy sacrifice, folks. Uh, He's not going to accept that body if it ain't holy. Now, what does He say to us in the New Covenant? He says, present your body uh, a living sacrifice. Now, what? A uh, holy and acceptable. Listen, if there's something acceptable unto God, then surely there's something unacceptable, folks. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Seem like I'm doing most of the talking tonight. It says that in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.13, he says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. You know, Moses looking forward and the children of Israel couldn't see past their, where they was at. He says, But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, Christ takes away this veil, folks. You know, I mean, it says there that when the reading of the law is there, that the veil is still upon their heart. But when when they turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, this kind of goes back to, to what God revealed to me over there Monday night. Like I said, I don't really understand all I even know about it. But when I ask God, Lord, take away this veil, uh, it's just as sure as I can see you all sitting here tonight. God spoke to me somehow there. Uh, he said some people don't want to have the veil taken away. You see, there's lots of people in the church that don't want to see the truth. Uh, there's lots of people. You know, people ask me all the time, you seeking this, you seeking that. Listen, I'm seeking everything God will give me, folks. I want everything that He's got. Uh, if He's He's got anything left that I ain't got, and I'm sure he has got a whole pot full of it up there. I just assume him go ahead and pour it out on me right now. You know, I'll take anything God's got to give me, folks. I don't know why that people are so blinded to the truth. It is, I want to be so blinded to the truth. Now, I know that God has a greater blessing for us than what we've ever had in our life. You see, uh, Sunday night was great, but I also know this. Uh, it wasn't a drop in the bucket compared to what God could have poured out on this service Sunday night. Tonight, uh, and tonight, and the next service that we're in, and all these things, uh, it is our iniquities that separate us from God, though. You see, uh, there's something in our lives that we've not been yet willing to lay down. You see, uh, I preached about that rod of Moses down here Sunday morning, talking about uh, how that God told him to lift it up and stretch it out and extend it. Now uh, listen, there's a somewhere in our life that that power of God uh, has not been allowed to extend into just yet. You see, uh, there's something that we've not changed, that we should have changed. And I'm not talking about what you don't know tonight. I'm talking about what God has already convicted you of. You see, I put that little thing on Facebook a while back. Roseanne put it on there again today. What have we become, you see? If the man Jesus Christ, as He walked this earth in the flesh, knocked on your door tonight when you got home, and He said to you, I'm just going to follow you around for a month or two. I'm going to take every step you take. I'm going to hear every word that you hear. Here, I'm going to see everything that you see. Now, how many of us would have to stop watching what we watch on TV? Now, how many of us would have to stop saying the things that we say to our husband or our wife, to our co-workers at work, or whatever it may be? Now, how many of us would have to hide a bunch of magazines and a bunch of old junk like that? Now, listen, I'm telling you, God sees all that whether you can see Him standing there or not. What makes us think that He don't already know? It's because we're blinded. With this veil that we've chosen ourselves, folks. There's so many people 
Well, I'm doing this because my my wife does it, my husband does it, I can't hardly get out of it. Listen. Don't bring that. <laughs> you know, that ain't gonna work. God's not gonna use that. He ain't gonna allow that, you know. A lot of women. They say, well, God told me to submit to my husband. That's probably the only thing you submit to is the, the thing that you know don't please God. Everything else, you don't listen to a word He says, you know? You just use that to justify the wrong thing you do. Listen, it's one way or the other, folks. I mean, I, you know, I know it's tough, but that's how it is. In Hebrews 6.18, He says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. We fled for refuge that we can lay hold. <laughs> I mean, I like that. You know, how you can lay hold on this hope. This ain't just something out there in front of you you can't get to. You can lay hold on this hope. <clears throat> Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. This, I like it. I mean, it's an anchor. This hope is an anchor of the soul. You know, what's an anchor for? It's to keep you from moving, ain't it? Right? It's to make you unmovable. Now, be not soon shaken, you know? I mean, come on. Both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. See this hope that we have is in Christ Jesus? Amen? Amen. <laughs> And Christ Jesus has done away with this veil, you know. In Hebrews 10.19, He says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, I ain't like that one guy. I don't think I am the holy of holies. <laughs> but I can go there. You see, I can go into that Holy of Holies tonight. I can get to the holiest place that God has Absolutely. through and by this blessed hope of Christ that we have. Now listen, it says, By a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say His flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Now I didn't mean to do this, but I wound up right back where I preached from Monday night. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it. I, it just happened, you know. Just God just worked it. Let us draw near with a true heart, in in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Now listen, if you ain't heard nothing else I've said tonight, and nothing here has made you happy, that maybe this one. For He is faithful that promised. That ought to make you just tickle to death tonight. That the One who has promised us all this is faithful. You know, I told him over at Bark Road the other night, here's this friend of mine, I ain't talked to him none in two years, called me Monday. Talked for two hours and ten minutes about God. This church... We've prayed and prayed and prayed. And I know we've got a long way to go. But it's like I said, tonight there's more people up singing than there used to be in the church. A year ago. A year ago. God has given the increase, folks. God has been working. I could name you just one example right after another. I was thinking about Tina's testimony the other night talking about two months to recover from that car wreck that they didn't think she would even live from. And she told us about a benefit singing they had two months to the day after she had that wreck. And as we started out the door, Mike said, do you know who sung at that benefit singing? Tina did. Now, think about that. Tina was able to sing at her own benefit singing, folks. Listen, He is faithful that He's promised us. Uh, if you trust Him tonight, He's going to be faithful. Now I want to read this in, in Matthew 27, verse 50. He says, Jesus, when He had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, in two, in other words, uh, from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after His resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now, it says that the veil in the temple was rent in twain, from the top to the bottom. 
Now, let's use the conservative estimate and say, let's say it like this. This four inch thick, four ton veil that hung in the temple that horses could not pull apart, that it took 300 priests to move about. That is what was rent in twain. It wasn't a piece of paper hanging up there, folks. It wasn't a piece of cloth. It wasn't a curtain. It was a four inch thick veil. It was put there to separate us from the very presence of God. Now, Christ, as He gave up the ghost right here, uh, the Bible says that the veil in the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Well, uh, the thing is at least 30 foot tall. There ain't no man going to be able to reach the top of it to, to tear it in two or anything like that. You know, and they didn't get it from the bottom to the top. Trust me, listen. Uh, probably the only people in there was the Jews and they didn't want anybody to know that Christ was the Son of God. Uh, so why would they tell a big lie about it or something like that? You know, They're going to tell the truth, if anything. Now, and they say that this veil was rent from the top to the bottom. Listen, uh, the presence of God come down from heaven. The Bible talks about uh, the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke coming down down from heaven. All this, uh, here comes this presence of God. Now, uh, it don't just uh, tiptoe onto the scene or anything like that. Uh, the presence of God enters into this place uh, just like a roaring lion, folks. Uh, he comes in there with a vengeance. There's my plug for the Avenger movie. Uh, he comes in there with, with a vengeance uh, and he tears this four inch thick veil from the top to the bottom. Uh, and guess what happens tonight? You're sitting back there thinking, well, uh, man, I really need that guy up there to pray for me. Listen, I'm going to tell you what happened that day. Uh, Jesus Christ made it so that you tonight uh, could come to Him personally. Listen, uh, you don't have to come through me. I'll be tickled to death to pray with you. Uh, but if you don't want me praying with you, all you got to do is come uh, and cry out on this name of the God, folks. Uh, listen, because He's made a way for you tonight. Uh, and you ought to be excited about it if you're not tonight. He has made a way for you. Uh, listen, before this, before this happened this day, uh, you could not come to God like you can now. Uh, you could not pray and have God hear your prayer. Uh, you had to find some high priest somewhere uh, and cause him to offer sacrifice for himself uh, so that he could be sanctified. God could cleanse him. Uh, pray to God he don't have a bad thought while he's in there, folks. Boy, I'm telling you, I've heard tell, I don't know that it's right, but I've heard tell that they would tie a rope on that man in case he got in there uh, and God struck him dead and they pulled him out. I don't know if it's right or not, uh, but I do know this, if he died, he just hurt him because nobody could come in there after him, folks. Listen, uh, God had to sanctify him. He had to cleanse him before he went in. Uh, you had to depend on somebody uh, that had the same infirmity that you got tonight, that carried the same flesh that you carry tonight. You say, well, them priests didn't fail. Listen, you better read your Bible uh, because they failed time after time just like we do, folks. There was no difference. They carried the same flesh. But Christ, as He hung on the cross, He gave up this ghost. He cried out to the Father. He committed His Spirit unto Him, you see. And when that ghost left Him, when that soul departed from that body, the presence of God entered. You talk about a mighty Russian wind. <laughs> I mean... The presence of God entered and it tore this veil, this four inch thick veil, from the top to the bottom. And the power of God was made manifest so that the earth did quake and the rocks were broken in pieces, folks. The graves opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. That's going to happen again one of these days. You know? Of course, I mean, there'd be a lot of people, like we said a while back, you know, they're saying, ain't no grave going to hold my body down and they can't get out from under a queen size comforter on Sunday morning. You know? I mean, if we ain't got power over that, you know, <laughs> I mean, how much power are we going to have over a six foot blanket of dirt, you know? God's done so much for us. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm telling you, this veil made to separate us from God, made to keep us away from Him. <laughs> it's gone. 
It's completely gone. It's torn in two. It's gone. The presence of God has already got out. And so many Christians tonight, we're trying our best to crawl right back under that old thing. We're trying our best to be blinded again. We're, we're living in <coughs> self-justification. And I've done that before. And, and I've just like I said a minute ago, I've had to repent for that. You know, I, I've had to change that about me. And, and if I'm doing it now, Lord help me. I don't know it. If I am, I pray that He shows me. I pray that He opens my eyes to that so that I can correct that too. But I'm telling you tonight, somebody be getting a song here. I'm telling you tonight, there is a greater blessing than you've ever had. There is a salvation that you've never had. There, there is a healing that you've never had. There, there's something greater than what you've ever had in your life. I mean, surely we can understand tonight that God must have more than what we've ever had. Listen, He's all powerful. You know, He He shook this place. He tore this veil. He broke the rocks. He opened the graves. He He put life where there had been nothing but death before. You know? If He can do all that, surely He can give you something better than you've ever had tonight. Now, why any? Well, could it be that your iniquities have separated between you and your God? That's Bible. That's not me. That's Bible now. I know that's kind of tough, but I know that the reason that God has not blessed me more is because I have failed Him when I had no excuse to fail. But I tell you, I pray that God gives me more strength and I pray that He helps me to recognize that, that bait the devil throws out there in front of me. You see, I, I pray that God helps me not to fail. He makes me stronger. He, he makes me a more willing vessel and a, a more honorable, honorable vessel unto Him tonight. I pray that God makes me a better Christian. You see, if, I, if I'm a better Christian, I'll be a better everything. You see? <laughs> And I'll receive more of the blessings of God. And I want them. I want them tonight. I tell you, I want the blessings of God tonight. So as we stand, y'all got a song ready? This altar is open. <coughs> Come and pray. There ain't no veils to separate you. So come and pray tonight. Oh for you. He separated you. He separated under, under the old covenant, but He's made a, a straight path tonight uh, for you to reach God Himself. The presence of God. Get a hold of Him tonight. Pray The Bible says that if you believe in your heart, that God has raised Him from the dead and you confess that with your mouth uh, that you shall be saved tonight. Now, if God's bidding you, if He's drawing you tonight, that's how you get born again. You believe tonight. You have to get it down into the heart. Believe that God has raised Him from the dead. Confess that tonight with your mouth. Uh, and wait for the change in your life, folks. It's coming.